inherited two models of political organization. We inherited the, the unity model, the party model, in which, of course, different people participate, women participate, people of different races, blah, 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 but there must be one agenda and there must be one central organization. That's the one model we, the primary model we inherited. And so in opposition to that arose, I realize I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying the whole goddamn thing, but nonetheless, I think you're, you'll identify with some of this. In opposition to that arose, models of organization based on difference. Like, forget it, we're not going to organize under your unified agenda and your leadership. We're going to organize on our own agenda. And so uh, with our own form of organization, in many ways, anti-racist struggles in the US lead the way in this, feminist struggles, gay and lesbian struggles in, in, in quite a different way. But nonetheless, posing the, uh, in objection to the unity model, a model based on difference and a kind of separation. And so I think we were, we were faced with this contradiction in political terms between identity and difference, implying two models of organization that were in some ways irreconcilable. Well, along comes Seattle in 1999, the WTO protests, which I think, by the way, is not the advent of this, but it's the time in which many were forced to confront it. We recognized that there was a new kind of activism involved. Because in Seattle, for instance, what we too, and certainly the press moreover, had trouble understanding is there were all these groups working together that even in objective terms were contradictory to one another. And yet they were working together without any centralized leadership. There were, for instance, the classic example is how is it the environmentalists and the trade unions were working together? But not only them, the church groups and the anarchists and the gay and lesbian groups and the people against the prison industrial complex and the people against the Gap and Starbucks and McDonald's, you name it. It was, it was a, in fact, that's what the, the, the journalists just threw up with their hands and said, this thing makes no sense. There's, there are all these different groups and there's no unified organization, there's no one to talk to, there are no spokespeople, etc. So I think that what we saw as something was different. In fact, this is something like an experiment in the multitude, it seems to me. It's, a, it's an experiment in singularity, each group organized under its own agenda, its own form of organization, and nonetheless, despite their singularity, or maybe even because of their singularity, uh, cooperating together. That it's a, I mean, I don't mean it as a realized uh, utopia or something, but it's an experiment in this. And so, in conceptual terms, that contradictory couple of identity and difference has now been displaced by a, com a complementary couple, so the contradictory couple by a complementary couple of singularity and commonality. Like that this, the singularity of each group and the commonality of the struggle are no longer a contradiction. In fact, it seems obvious that they're together. That's, and that seems to me a new, a new generation of activism. It's a new generation of activism, but we can already see in previous slogans, generation slogans, desires for that and propositions of that. Like think, for instance, of the, um, of the uh, anti-racist slogan in, you know, in the US saying, we don't want a world without race. We want a world in which race doesn't matter. Like in other words, we don't want a world without difference. We want a world with difference. We, but we want a world in which difference doesn't imply hierarchy. This seems to me already <coughs> a, a, a demand for something like the multitude, you know, singularity and, and equality of cooperation. Um, or it'd be a better thing to say, like Audrey Lloyd saying that our differences are our strength. That's another notion about singularity and, and commonality working together. Okay, that's, um, it's time for me to stop, but I should do just one last suggestion, just because I said I would do it at the beginning. Um, seems to me, or I would like to find a way to develop and introduce love as a political concept, and precisely as a political concept that can name this project. You know, the thing I haven't done yet is I haven't said what is democratic about this, and I guess I was, well, I was suggesting through all this and taking for granted that this notion of the multitude in its various aspects is at least an avenue towards thinking democracy and thinking of democracy in a different way. That even just the formula of singularity, say the full expression of differences, and you know, cooperation and equality, that itself could be a first way of thinking about democracy and democracy today. So the, the last, this is a retreat to the conceptual, I guess, is thinking about love as a political concept. And what I mean by this, you know, it's, um, although we talked about it this afternoon and uh, in different ways, everyone was sort of on the same page, I don't know exactly. I find that in movement context, 
everyone knows exactly what I talk about, I'm talking about is fine. Also, uh, strangely, but to my own discomfort, talking at theological seminaries, which I get invited to do a lot now, very strangely for many to do that, they also are very happy when I talk about love. That's completely up their alley. But in universities, everyone gets squirmy when I start talking about love. It's seminal, it's gross. I don't know exactly what the thing is. And so the thing is that um, the difficulty, I think, in thinking a political concept of love, and in fact, the political concept of love has been destroyed. The political concept of love we do have traditions of, particularly in pre-modern Judaic Christian traditions. Love properly as a, as, a, as a definition of the community, as a project of the community, as a political project, and that it's been and that it's been sequestered within the faith. And that's what makes people so uncomfortable talking about it, because love is only imaginable now in its um, in the in the in the in the confines of the couple, plus the couple's extended appendages or something like that. And that what I'm asking for and thinking that it's necessary to do is to think uh, love as a political concept, as, a, as a, a social concept of political action. In fact, there are two aspects of this that I guess I'd want to emphasize that are still different uh, with, you know, not only do I think uh, the concept of love in order to become a political concept has to be free uh, from the confines of the family or the couple and be able to extend across social space. Yeah, and by the way, I don't mean, I don't mean we have to stop loving our mothers and loving our partners, etc. I mean that not only that, that's what, that we have to be able to think love in a more expanded way. Um, the two other things I think have to be done is to, um, is first to reattach the different notions of love that are traditionally separated by Christian theology. Christian theologians are very, um, are very uh, studious in separating agape, a sort of uh, love of the community, philia, uh, friendship, and eros. Um, and I think that we act, that it's much more useful and appropriate to think. Um, an interaction among these different faces, the faces of love in the public. And the second is to um, save love from the um, merging in unity. Uh, this is also common to m many of Christian Jewish theology, but then German Romanticism, for instance. I mean, the, about the two melding into one, you could think of even of dialectics as a, as a um, apotheosis of this sort of merging. And that we rather have to think love as this communication among singularities. If you see, I wonder if you can see how it's already... This, and and the, here's the one positive example that I have, because um, I seem to always take recourse to Spinoza. Let me just try Spinoza's geometrical proposition of love and see how it might help for this. Because when Spinoza defines love as the increase of my power with the recognition of an external cause, so the, in fact, it's the, it's the um, affect of joy, the increase of my power, with the recognition of the cause by another. There's nothing, there's no mystical merging here. You see, by the way, I would love to do a sort of genealogy of the destruction of the political concept of love, where you could have romanticism in that merging in one link to the mysticism, like Benjamin, Sholem, and those people. And then on the other side, uh, you could have uh, sad to batai, in other words, the separation of eros out as its own separated uh, political rationality, etc. I think that these are two ways in which love has been segregated philosophically, you know, that happened from the 18th to the 20th century. Anyway, what Spinoza says here, the, the, the um, joy, you know, the increase of my power, with a recognition of an external cause, it does imply both two aspects of it that seem important to me. Both the, the relationship to power, you know, like what Partly when we think of a political conception of love, it's about power. You know, I don't mean power over other people, it's our power to do things. That's what joy means for Spinoza. Our power to think, our power to construct. So it's a question of power, and it's a question of power based on difference. It's not some merging into unity, it's recognizing the external difference. It's based on this separate, you know, continuing difference of singularities. And so in that way, we might think of love, or a political concept of love, as a way of understanding and thinking this uh, notion of multitude as the you know, the project of of uh, singularity plus cooperation or autonomy plus plus commonality. I think I should stop there. I'm sorry. I went. Over. I don't.